Assalamualaikum. Thank you everyone for joining us. So basically our attendees at the, attendee at the moment, Prof, is our, uh, not only from our department, but also some of them are actually from other universities as well, but also from the OFTA department, yeah? It's either the lectures or the trainee. So without uh, uh, wasting time, just allow me to introduce Prof Zah to all our participants. For the UKM people, I think Prof Zah needs no introduction. But for uh, other university, I think uh, you also have known about some of us also actually were student for Prof Zaliha. So just to recap everything now, Prof Zaliha is our super, super senior consultant and also our teachers. So she, has, she was also the dean for the faculty. Uh, sorry, Jack Prof Zaliha, I think they have prepared a, a, I share screen sekejap, yeah? I think they have prepared some PowerPoint. Yep, there you go. So um, she was also the dean of the faculty uh, from uh, until the year of 2017. Prof Zaliha has also published more than 100 articles, uh, several books and also chapters in a book with more than 150 abstracts and proceedings. Uh, Prof is currently active in a lot of research uh, and the recent one is the virtual reality uh, project uh, with the industry. Prof also has published a local and international article and Currently, our prof also is a black belt holder in Taekwondo uh, uh, to keep up with your four kids during your spare time. That's very interesting, prof. Okay, um, can we just uh, start the session? The, talk, the topic that prof Zaliha is going to give to us is on the importance of impactful research on the future of academician or clinician and how to achieve it. Uh, I pass over to you, prof. Okay, uh, if I may share my screen. Okay, allow me just, I stop sharing for a while. There you yeah. go. Okay. Right. Okay, right. Uh, first and foremost, I think I would like to thank uh, the Oftal Department for giving me this opportunity to give uh, this lecture on research. And um, I've always got this uh, passion to try to inspire our young uh, academicians um, to um, immerse themselves in the um, uh, uh, field of uh, research. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pros and cons in that. A lot of people say all sorts of things when you join an uh, academic institution. Uh, but I would say that um, uh, most, if not all of us, um, have got some tendency or um, inclination towards um, uh, conducting research, that curiosity to know more than what is just, uh, what, what is uh, beyond what you read in the, uh, 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 the printed um, uh, literature. Uh, and uh, that is what brings you to uh, the academic uh, uh, side. Uh, otherwise, you would have, um, um, you know, um, uh, continued in uh, just purely clinical uh, field, for example, whether it's private or uh, public. Uh, but the fact that you want to join an, a university, uh, that should mean that you want to uh, satisfy your curiosity in uh, uh, expanding your uh, knowledge uh, beyond what uh, is already known. Okay, and uh, I would like also to thank um, uh, uh, the Department of Ophthalmology, at particularly um, Wan Hastina, for kindly preparing the slides for me since it's um, uh, um, I had very little time to prepare for it, but um, uh, it's the basis of what I'm going to talk today. Uh, I'm going to enlarge on uh, what is uh, written in the slides. Okay. And thanks, Musha, for the kind introduction. Right. What is impactful research? Um, doing research is one thing but uh, doing impactful research needs a particular strategy. Uh, this is what has been said by somebody. Most researchers assume that uh, research is a quest uh, for the truth. Now, uh, we all know that you know, the truth is sometimes quite relative. Okay, what is the truth today may not be the truth tomorrow. What was the truth yesterday may not be the truth today. You know, even in our treatment of patients, you know, what was the drug of choice yesterday may not be the same today. So, um, 
the discovery of truth would automatically be impactful. But however, uh, research um, is impactful not simply because it is true, because as I said, true is very uh, relative to time, to place, and all sorts of other things. But if it refutes the assumption or belief of its audience, that means your audience initially believed in something, but because you bring something else in your research, a new discovery, it refutes that truth and it changes the mindset and the practice of your audience. So, Truthfulness of a proposition is of limited duration, as I've mentioned. Um, new research emerges and knowledge accumulates and expands. Okay? What matters is merely whether the research runs counter to what is currently assumed to be true, meaning that the outcome of your research uh, now tells people that you know, there is something else beyond what has always been believed to be true. Okay? Knowledge expands. Uh, it's interesting. That is what is impactful. Your, the, the way that you can change uh, the mindset and the practice of people. Okay, And the journey is actually not uh, simple and straightforward. It is not like you publish today, tomorrow everybody change their practice and change their mindset. It's definitely not that easy. Okay, uh, One research that I did in uh, 1990s, uh, one research which I published in 1998, which was my, uh, my MD thesis, uh, the paper from that, um, the research work that I did, the impact was actually uh, quoted as an uh, um, impactful citation in 2011. It was 13 years after. So you've just got to be um, patient. You know, knowledge doesn't uh, bring about change just like that in the uh, blink of an eye. Okay, you've got to be patient and in time people will see the value of your research. You yourself may not be able to see it now. Okay, but many years from now, somebody is going to pick it up and say, hey, you know, there is some value or real, you know, jewel in this particular research. Now, the impact of a publication. Um, I know that, you know, when our um, uh, recent uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Prof Hamdi, uh, talked about, um, you know, publishing in only WOS journals and all that, you know, journals with impact factors, um, suddenly everybody felt that, um, you know, it's, to some people at that moment, you know, it was like so discouraging, why should we be just going for um, uh, journals with impact factor, it's not easy to get in there, you know, why not, uh, you know, stick to Scopus as well, although there's no uh, impact factor maybe. Uh, but um, what you need to remember is that um, it is only when you uh, publish in journals which are of uh, good impact factor, the impact factor actually tells you that that journal is often quoted. Okay, so if you manage to, to publish in that kind of journal, um, your article will uh, very likely be cited more than if you were to publish in uh, journals which do not have impact factors, okay, or of low impact factor. Uh, therefore, um, your publication and your work, your research work will have a better impact in the sense that the readership is wider and a lot more people will find your research work useful. So the impact of a publication is measured by the citation of your published studies. If your uh, studies are not cited, then uh, it means that um, it's, it's almost like nobody's reading your uh, studies, for example. Or even if they read, they do not think that it is significant enough uh, for them to use it um, to quote your, uh, your study as something which is of significance. Okay? Um, and the in index of citation that we normally use is H index. Now, this is important in many ways. Okay? Um, uh, and uh, the H index may differ according to the uh, platform uh, through which it is uh, quoted. Okay, Google Scholar may give you a different um, H index 
compared to Scopus, compared to Pablon WOS, for example. Okay, uh, but whatever it is, okay, impact of a publication is the future currency of a research. Okay. Uh, this is a study I did. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned to you just now. Uh, the uh, publication from my MD uh, work. Um, it was published in uh, Journal of Physiology in 1998, but it was only in 2011 that it was, although over the years there were many citations, but this was the most important citation, I would say, you know, in this thematic review. Uh, by University of Wisconsin Medicine in US, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the top 50 universities in US. Um, it says that, um, uh, well, I, I was quite surprised at that time. They said, um, you know, my study was like the earliest hallmark study. I was, and I thought, oh my God, you know, but it's, it's pleasing and it, it you know, uh, makes you, um, uh, feel that you have done something significant when somebody mentions that sort of thing about the work that you have done. I'm sure you agree with me, you know. And uh, here it says um, it's a groundbreaking early observation. Um, at the time when I did this and published this, I never thought of it that way, okay. It was um, calcium signaling characteristics in uh, endothelial cells uh, from uh, women who are pregnant, who are non-pregnant, and who are preeclamptic. Okay, we were comparing, and we found that you know uh, those uh, uh, the the characteristics were similar between those who were non-pregnant and the preeclamptic ones. The uh, the normal pregnancy behave in a different manner. So the preeclamptic cells behave as though they were not pregnant. Okay, and uh, the cells were taken from. Um, hand vein endothelial cells from the mother. I believe this is the only study in the world so far that uses hand vein endothelial cells. Um, people were using um, umbilical vein endothelial cells, which were quite easy to harvest. We did some study on that as well, but this one, the, um, the one uh, that I did for my uh, MD thesis was hand vein endothelial cells using a 14 gauge cannula, uh, you know, to take blood from the mother's um, dorsum of the hand. Um, fortunately, pregnant women have got large veins, you know, so um, it, there was a technique we call traumatic venipuncture. Even the name itself sounds very traumatic, right? Um, we got to get the cells from there and uh, culture that in the lab and uh, look at the calcium signaling char characteristic using microspectrophotometry. So, it was very tedious. I used to start, I used to uh, work in the lab up until uh, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning before I went home uh, alone. Uh, I got to lock the door so that nobody uh, bothers me, but, uh, you know, because of security reasons and all that. And um, even trying to isolate the cells were not easy. Okay. When I first uh, was given this study, I, the first thing I found that was that um, the um, methodology uh, that was recommended to be used uh, under that grant didn't work, okay? So I had to uh, redo the methodology all over again by myself. Uh, that took a full year, you know, and by then I had only another year to finish my MD because MD is two years, although it is the same level as uh, PhD, level eight. Uh, but it's only for two years because it's um, a lot of, um, it, it's considered as very clinical because we deal with patients. Okay. So that was the story of um, how I did this research. And um, I actually went to do this MD without any scholarship from U, uh, UKM. Uh, it was on my own. But Alhamdulillah, there was a, a grant from uh, the Royal College of ONG that um, footed the bill of the, um, uh, the lab work and all that. So Alhamdulillah. So what I'm trying to say is that um, it is not easy to do good research. Okay, When um, I was almost on the verge of giving up because you know uh, I tried many uh, methods in order to isolate the cells and it didn't work. What my... Um, mentor and uh, supervisor said to me at that time, Professor William Dunlop, who was the uh, president of the RCOG. Um, he said, um, Zaleha, if 
this work can be done by any Tom, Dick and Harry, do you think it is um, uh, worth doing it? The fact that you know, it is difficult to do means that there has to be something good in the outcome. So, and it's only 13 years later that I found that somebody actually quoted it in a very nice way, saying that the study elegantly described calcium signaling and all that, and uh, that made my day. So be patient as a researcher, okay? And uh, this is how your uh, age index can be quoted. You can see here, okay, Google Scholar will give a different age index compared to um, Scopus, compared to WOS, okay? So um, it's one of the things is because uh, like Google Scholar, for example, you can actually manually add papers that uh, is not uh, uh, sort of picked out uh, from the internet by Scopus, by WOS, okay? But uh, for Scopus and WOS, uh, sometimes there are um, certain um, sort of rigid uh, limitations, like for example, ResearchGate, it doesn't also allow you to add papers unless there are certain things in the authorship, uh, the way the authorship is written, uh, that makes it um, uh, able to be uh, listed in the um, uh, in in the portal. Okay, so so each index is a numerical indicator of the contribution, productivity, and influence of a researcher. Basically, what it says is um, how many numbers of uh, your papers has got at least that number of citations. Like for example, if uh, 20 of your papers have got at least 20 citations, then your age index is 20. So somebody with an age index of uh, 25, for example, it means that that person has got 25 uh, publications, uh, which has got at least 25 citations each. All right, at least. Okay. So that's what age index means. Um, it is important uh, in the sense that um, it measures the productivity and citation impact of the publications of a person. And this is useful in many ways. Okay. Um, it is an essential reference for many researchers and managers in the academic world. Somebody who wants to hire you, they look at the age index. Somebody who wants to give you a research grant, they look at age index. Even our, uh, my grant platform, okay, if you do not have an age index, okay, um, it's very difficult for anyone to pick you up as a um, co-researcher uh, in any grant application. Okay, it may be um, uh, uh, rejected. Okay, so you have to have uh, some age index. That means some citation of your work before you can be listed. So it is one of the measures funding agencies uh, for grants or the university's hiring committee calculate when you apply for a grant or a position. Okay, and it's also important for the university's ranking, for example, Myra, QS, Times, and all that. All right, so how to increase your ish uh, index. Well, for one thing, um, if you're a young researcher, you can join collaborations with more mature researchers, okay? Uh, the popularity of an author will influence citation because uh, the credibility uh, of the author um, usually depends on how popular or how much the author is cited, okay? And uh, so search for collaboration opportunities with famous researchers and authors. Now, in this uh, respect, I would say that similarly, uh, in an institution, if, if you are a senior researcher, okay, try to be mentors to the young researchers out there. Okay, um, bring them with you so that they, they will have a good chance to then uh, flourish in their research and publication, okay? Uh, for many researchers, that is how, uh, you know, the hierarchy uh, works in research, okay? Um, you are somebody small in the beginning and you collaborate with a senior researcher and you get up that ladder. And uh, um, when you're up there, you stretch out an olive branch 
to the young ones, okay, in uh, down in the ladder and bring the, the person up, okay. So that is how uh, things should work, okay. We should all collaborate in order to help each other. And uh, publish in well-known established journals, uh, those which are not only peer-reviewed, but um, WOS journals with impact factor. And publish in open access. This may be uh, a bit costly, okay? Uh, some journals um, uh, charge even up to say uh, 10,000 or near to that. I think most of the like Q1, Q2 journals would charge uh, around that figure, about 10,000 or between um, eight to 10,000 ringgit, okay? Uh, for one paper to be published. Uh, however, there are ways and means around that. Sometimes there are offers, okay, of uh, say uh, um, a waiver of the op uh, open access fees for certain reasons. Like for example, some time ago, uh, the Frontiers group of journals, uh, they offered uh, a, a total waiver of open access uh, for those who send in or submit um, uh, manuscripts related to COVID-19, okay, before 31st of July, all right? So those who managed to submit uh, during that time period uh, will be able to publish open access without having to pay a single cent, all right? And uh, sometimes you get, um, uh, um, what do you call that, discount uh, for services that you render to the general concern. Uh, for example, the BMC group, Okay, of journals, uh, they give a 15% discount if you are a reviewer. Okay, if you review uh, manuscripts for them, uh, and when you submit an article, uh, a manuscript to be published, they give you 15% discount, which can come to quite a bit uh, if the open access fee is quite a lot. Okay, now, of course, when it's open access, uh, more citation uh, can come in for your particular published article because people can easily retrieve it full text uh, from the internet, okay? Uh, the other way that you can also uh, popularize your uh, article, now when I say popularize and all that, it's not for the sake of having a good name and things like that, but you must also think about the impact in terms of you are being instrumental in expanding knowledge in this world, all right? Um, I, I think about it, I, I regard it that way, okay? Um, and uh, in ResearchGate, for example, um, sometimes you find somebody uh, sending a message to you, um, asking you for the full text of a particular uh, article that you have published, okay? And um, uh, you can share a personal copy just to that particular person. That is not wrong, okay? Just that you cannot share it, uh, you know, in public if it is not, uh, you know, an open access uh, article. Okay, so be careful, all right? When you, re when you share on ResearchGate, it is always safe to, uh, to share individually on a personal basis uh, as a private sharing, okay? Uh, now, having said that, um, I find that quite a number of our academicians do not look after their research gate portal, their um, Google Scholar portal, and any other portal. Okay, even your university's specific portal, like for example, we have UKM Sarjana. Okay, I would like to um, urge all of you, uh, particularly uh, young researchers, okay, to look after these uh, portals that you have because they are very valuable. These are the portals through which you can reach out or people can reach out to you, okay? And you can uh, put your publication and all the hard work that you have put into your research to good use for others to not only cite, but use the knowledge that you have brought uh, into this world, okay? Uh, to good use. Okay, whether it is good use uh, in terms of uh, changing uh, clinical uh, practice or in terms of expanding that research. You know, you might have got to do just with a simple receptor here and there and somebody else can use that in order to 
uh, expand the um, the magnitude of knowledge that uh, can be uh, um, uh, uh, triggered from there. Okay. And publish in a journal with an appropriate audience. Okay. Ask yourself who your article is written for, and uh, uh, what is the most important journal for this particular audience. Like for example, if you are in pediatrics, uh, I'm sure you, you understand that. You know why you perhaps shouldn't be uh, uh, publishing in an uh, orthopedics journal, which has got nothing to do with, with pediatrics. Of course, if it is pediatric orthopedic, then it is fine. Okay, but if it's got to do with a liver problem in pediatrics, for example, you should not be uh, uh, publishing it in an orthopedics journal, that sort of thing. So simple, common sense. All right. And uh, promote your work also through attending conferences and research meetings. Uh, and uh, search for new collaboration opportunities. Sometimes, you know, when you present or your uh, postgraduate present uh, a poster or oral presentation in a conference and the uh, abstract or proceeding is published somewhere, okay, some other researcher in the world may pick it up, okay, and uh, contact you perhaps through email. I've had this happen before. Um, it was a simple uh, study on nifedipine in preterm labor for, for the prevention of preterm labor that we published in uh, uh, through um, um, as an abstract, you know, um, after presenting it at an RCOG uh, World Congress. Okay, it so happened that the World Congress was held in Kuching at that time, so it was quite near. Okay. Then um, many months later, I received an email from, uh, from Holland, from Netherlands, okay, uh, asking me whether I would like to uh, share that data, okay, because they wanted to put it into a, a sort of a kind of review, uh, uh, which includes many other uh, small researchers as well. All right, so uh, we agreed to collaborate. And uh, after a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, work going back and forth between uh, Netherlands and us, okay, that paper was finally published in BJOC, British Journal of ONG, which is the top 10 journal in the world for ONG. So this was in 2016. The paper was initially um, published uh, as a small study in 2012. So this is what I, I'm, I, I mean, okay? So that's one example. And uh, I remember there was this uh, study on uh, vitamin E that I presented in a, a conference, um, RCOG con Congress again, World Congress in, uh, in Egypt, okay? And um, uh, ours was the first study uh, where we, we tried to look at uh, vitamin E for prevention of preeclampsia. And after look, uh, doing a lot of literature review, we found that the best is to, uh, you know, any preventive measure should come before 16 weeks pregnancy. Okay. There was a paper by Hermida et al. at that time that we found that says that, you know, any preventive measure should uh, be instituted before 16 weeks pregnancy in order for it to have full impact in preventing the disease, okay? And uh, when I presented it in, uh, at the, uh, uh, sorry, this was ISSHP in 2004, all right, in Europe, all right? And uh, um, I went up to the rostrum and told the, um, uh, the audience that uh, this is what we found, that um, any preventive work for uh, preeclampsia should come before, should be uh, uh, prescribed before 16 weeks in order to be effective. And uh, well, uh, although our names were not um, quoted or anything like that, you will find that now, if you look at any uh, uh, strategy for prevention of preeclampsia, in all the guidelines in the world, it says you must um, start the uh, prophylactic uh, measure before 16 weeks gestation. So I'm, I'm happy to see that that has an impact, 
Okay, the people were there at that in the audience at that time included people like Jim Roberts, who is like the doyen of uh, preeclampsia research in the world at that time. Okay, so these small little things are the ones that you know will make your study have an impact later on. Okay, it takes years, but it will happen. Okay. And uh, searching for new collaboration opportunities, right? The other uh, example that I would like to quote is uh, one um, email that came out of the blue from a startup group uh, based in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area where Facebook originated, okay? Where the HQ of Facebook is, okay? And uh, it was trying to, um, you know, call for collaboration to um, test um, a new uh, app a mobile app that they were trying out, okay, um, which they, they sort of um, uh, thought out um, at a hackathon, a health hackathon. And uh, um, I responded to that. And as a result of that, we were part of the um, uh, testing out of a mobile app, uh, which now is uh, commercialized as List Runner app, okay. So those are the things that um, keep an open mind, always try to search for new opportunities. But of course, beware, you know, in this era of scam and all that. So, uh, but so far, I, uh, I haven't seen all, any research collaboration that has turned out to be a scam. Lah. Okay. And, um, and when you write your papers, think about your readers and the search engines and choose a good title and keywords, okay? That's also important uh, because when people search, they will use the keywords and uh, that's how your papers get, uh, you know, uh, fished out from the internet. Run the blog, be present on social media now. Uh, I'm not very active in social media, but I do agree okay, that uh, you can help gain uh, citations and new collaboration opportunities. For example, nowadays Twitter is very important, okay. A lot of uh, researchers use Twitter as a platform uh, to popularize their papers. When they uh, produce a paper, they publish a paper, they put it on Twitter. So those in the Twitter community will be able to pick it up, okay. Uh, but um, Attending conferences and meetings is still important. Nowadays, you can do it virtually, okay? It's still possible. So research is not a one-person work, it's a collective effort. You must always remember that teamwork is so, so, so important, okay? Um, there are things that you have to give and take in a team, all right? I always believe in that. And uh, um, nothing is ideal. Okay, there may be a lots of temperaments within a team. You've got to put up with that, uh, tolerate, and finally accept that your co-researchers are of a, uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, different, various, diverse backgrounds and personalities. Okay, but uh, it is only through teamwork that you will be able to achieve uh, great heights. Okay, and um, uh, some of you may uh, uh, have. Uh, seen this 1% uh, terbaik daripada lebih 26,000 universiti di seluruh dunia, that sort of thing. Uh, well, UKM is there and um, we hope to be able to uh, expand further and uh, nothing works better than collaborative work, okay? We should not be looking into UKM alone, okay? But should be expanding outside that. Um, collaboration may be with other universities and may also be with industry, okay? Uh, at the moment, I'm working with uh, industries like um, Aerodyne for my drone work, um, Integrasi Erat for my uh, VR work together with Dr. Musha, and uh, Dr. Musha is part of the team, and uh, with Mesiniaga for mobile apps, uh, that we are, we are doing for antenatal care. So these are the things that, um, uh, these are the ways and means that you can um, uh, expand your research work, okay? Uh, often you will need uh, support from there because the private sector works in a different way. Um, that culture uh, may be beneficial to your research work in certain ways, okay? You cannot completely be dependent on just the public sector.
So uh, with that, I thank you. Uh, all the best in your research journey. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be glad to uh, uh, take the uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. That was very, very, uh, I would say, enlightening. And, uh, you know, um, especially in the, 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 the journey, the long journey for your article to be sort of uh, recognised. Uh, well, what we hope to be one of those authors one day. Tak tahu lah sampai pencin pun tak ada. Hopefully, hopefully, one of our work will be uh, recognised and uh, has a an impact to the to the world. Hopefully, now um, any questions so far from the audience? Uh, anybody has any question can actually unmute your uh, microphone. Uh, meanwhile, let me just go through the chat in case there's any questions so far. Right, um, Professor, probably one question from me. Um, how, what would be your tip in getting people to, let's say you have an idea and you want, you want good people and all this uh, good collaborator to be part of your project, you know, what would be your tips on how to get everybody on board and also to encourage and, you know, get everybody excited with your ideas uh, so that everybody will be able to contribute equally? Because I find sometimes when we do collaboration, you know, some people collaborate so well, some people do not collaborate so well. So you now, how how do you, how do you, you know, uh, handle those situation? Okay, uh, good question, Musha. Um, it takes a lot of uh, well. At first, it it's like a marriage, right? Yes. Initially, it's a lot of tolerance. Of course, when you get to know each other, you get excited. Oh, you want to do this and that. And then after that, you find uh, your co-researchers have got quirks here and there, you know. Um, there may be um, difficult aspects of the personality and all that for you to cope with. But uh, if you, uh, per you, you persevere, okay, you're, you're patient, uh, you're able to tolerate, okay, and accept that diversity, you know, in people's, um, look at the good side of that person rather than the weaknesses. That's how I would always see it, you know, uh, in whoever you interact with, okay, it is important for you to see the good sides and um, the sort of, well, um, um, I hope the word is not, uh, it doesn't sound like manipulative or whatever, but the usefulness of that person, including yourself in that research project, you know? Uh, right, right. So if you, you really that, get to know them personally first before you get to invite yes. them or, or, you know, it can just be anyone by recommendation? Uh, not necessarily somebody you know, right, from your childhood or whatever. Although sometimes childhood or uh, school uh, connections are also important. Like, for example, the um, uh, collaboration that I have with MMU, you know, multimedia university, we are working, uh, Alhamdulillah, we've just got a PRGS 2.0 grant to work on animation now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the person, uh, the, the first trigger to that collaboration was my uh, primary school mate from wow. 40 years ago. Okay. We happened to meet by chance, you know, when uh, a group of them came to HUKM and searched for me high and low. Oh. And they finally found me in the dean's office at that time, you know. <laughs> So that was a good uh, reunion after 40 years of not seeing each other. And through them, I, I got to know that one of my friends is a uh, deputy dean in uh, MMU. Mm. And we, we, we had a sort of like mini reunion kind of thing. We talked about uh, collaborating and all that. And, uh, that, and she introduced her um, uh, a colleague there to me, who is very uh, enthusiastic about research and all that. Mm. Uh, so that was how it happened. You know, and one very important thing I must say is the trust. Okay, building the trust and having the trust in others. Okay, uh, that is very important, particularly when you work with the commercial sector. Right. You know, right. Right. We, in, we academicians, we sometimes, uh, you know, we often go into the mode of thinking people in the private sector think of nothing but profit, right? Right. You know, and exactly. That is, yeah, and that is very negative and often impedes good collaboration. So I think we have to have sangka baik with it all. You know, um, okay. get rid of all the prejudice and all that. And remember that these people also want to uh, create a good impact to the world. 
you know, and do something good, you know, not just talking about profit and money. Yeah, understand that, Prof. Understand yeah. that, Prof. Just to share about this, uh, I think the importance when Prof says about uh, collaborate with the senior people, right? Um, I, I, I truly believe in that because I remember doing my own grant, my own VR project. I just managed to get like 70,000 grant. When Prof and Prof Ismail Saibun get into the picture, you managed to get 1 million grant. I was like, oh my goodness. You know, it was like a big kind of thing. I was very, very impressed. So I think probably that's also one of the examples of the thing that, you know, get all these very senior people to help out uh, would help us um, hopefully create our path. Uh, Good ease our path, hopefully. Good that you brought up that one million thing. Yeah. Uh, I almost forgot to mention about that. Now, that wasn't a very easy job. Right. If uh, we worked on that uh, grant proposal for nine months. Wow, nine months. Yes. Um, you know, all of us collaborating, not only us in UKM, but also, and even in UKM, it was uh, Fakulti Perubatan plus Pergigian plus uh, IR 4.0. Plus, at that time, it was IVI, right? Institute mm -hmm. of Visual Informatics. And then um, with the company, I integrated around, okay? Over nine months, many, many meetings, okay? Polishing up the, the proposal and all that. And, and uh, a few visits to MOSTI, the uh, Mastec R&D Clinic. Oh, okay. Yeah, presenting to them and asking them for their opinion, whether the proposal is good enough and all that. Getting uh, feedback from them before we finally submitted that uh, proposal. I see, I see. Yeah. So you do go and make my step before the final submission. Yeah, that's right. If okay. there is any channel to uh, like uh, improve it, as particularly if the grant providers are the one who you know encourage you to come uh, to them uh, in order to uh, improve your proposal before submitting, go ahead. Okay. Right. Okay. That's one question yeah. from Dr. Wan, Prof. Wanasina. Do you think fundamental are better cited than clinical? And as academician and clinician at the same time, does further postgraduate studies necessary in publishing impactful research? So there are two questions there, Prof. Can you see that in the chat, Prof? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are two questions there from, from Prof. Wan. You want to yeah. answer that, Prof? Uh -uh. Do you think fundamental are better cited? Cited, is it? Than cited, I think. Cited, yeah. Um, I think uh, not necessarily uh, because um, I think clinical papers, uh, particularly if it is RCTs, randomized controlled trials, um, are well cited as well. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the, well, that's one thing about getting into the big picture, the multi-center trials that are not only you know, done by um, drug companies. I mean, those done by drug companies, I don't think they will cite you as an author. Okay, but uh, those which are started by academicians themselves, like for example, uh, we were involved with the MAGPIE trial last time, you know, this was in 2000, early 2000, you know, and the paper was published in 2002, okay, uh, this was, uh, uh, the, the steering committee was actually uh, one of the uh, universities in UK, all right, and uh, um, it was published in Lancet, and uh, that constituted, I think, about almost a thousand of my citations, you know? So, because it's a randomized controlled trial on magnesium sulfate use in preeclampsia. Now, talking about RCTs, okay, do keep, well, not only RCTs, but any research data that you have, keep the raw data well. There was one study which I did in uh, um, year 2000, early year 2000. Um, we completed it before 2005, okay, uh, and uh, this was from an IRPA grant, that those days, you know, we had IRPA grant, and uh, now it was very difficult to get that study done because even though we said just vitamin E in pregnancy, the ethics committee said, prove to us that vitamin E is not teratogenic in pregnancy. So it took 18 months from the time that I got the IRPA grant, okay, in order for me to uh, proved to them through an animal study with UM that uh, vitamin E, even in mega doses, does not affect uh, the fetus. All right? Wow. This rat study. So that was the amount of patients that we had. Grant dah dapat, about 200,000. You know, tapi mm. tak dapat nak mulakan because this, the, one of the ethics committee members said, you have to prove to us first that right. there is no doubt whatsoever that this is uh, not teratogenic, 
you know. So we did that animal study. Alhamdulillah, we managed to publish that one pula tu. Okay. Lepas tu barulah dapat mula this study in 2001. You know, <laughs> baru. <laughs> yeah, so we have to wait. Yeah, 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 we have to Uh, apa tu? It's not significant. There's no significant, um, you know, protective uh, effect of vitamin E. Hmm. Now, in 2014 and 2018, there were changes to the definition of preeclampsia. Hmm. So I thought, um, just last year, I thought, eh, why not we look back at the data? You know, since hmm. the definition of preeclampsia has changed, maybe hmm. the categorization of the outcome would change. Hmm. You know, some people yeah. whom we think were not PE now becomes PE. Mm-hmm. So we look back at the data from such a long time ago, 15 tahun lepas, mm-hmm. okay, and, uh, and re-categorize the patients according to the new uh, definition. And then we found that there were some confounding factors, so we did multivariate analysis. And mm-hmm. lo and behold, we found that vitamin E is protective against preeclampsia. Wow, okay. So sent that for publication now, so mm-hmm. tengah under review sekarang ni. So with the same set of data, but yes. you redefine really your name. Correct. Yeah. Right. Right. So you can get more than one publication from the same set of data, mm. and we 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 reported it as a secondary analysis. Right. Right. Yeah. right. After 15 years. After 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The second question, Prof. Um, Academician and clinician surgeon at the same time. Does further postgraduate studies necessary in publishing impactful research? Right. Okay. That reminds me of one more important thing. Mm. Now, to those of you who have not done your PhD, okay, even though you are clinicians, please consider that. Okay, because I think it really makes a difference for you to do a doctorate, whether it's an MD or a PhD. Okay, it doesn't matter. MD is doctorate in, med- in, in medicine. Okay, PhD, you know lah, uh, doctor of philosophy in whichever area. Okay, uh, whichever one you do, it is still very impactful because it gets you into that uh, research culture. Okay, the mindset of a researcher. Okay, because otherwise, what I see is. Uh, If you just continue as a clinician, you don't do your PhD or MD. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that um, everybody's the same. There are those who do not do MD PhD but still flourish in their uh, research work. But you will find less of those people compared to those who have done MD and PhD. They really go into full gear uh, research work and uh, go on to get grants for themselves. Um, Uh, the the dean has actually quoted my uh, department of ONG as um, the one with the most number of clinicians with PhD. I think it's quite true. I think more more than half of us have got uh, PhDs or MDs. Very impressive, Prof. Yeah, so... Uh, we have three in our department. Prof. Right. One, Prof. Sharp and also Prof. Jemaima. Can right. you miss anyone? Yeah, three. That makes uh, a difference to the um, publications and grants that we have been getting uh, lately. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Okay, good advice, Prof. Uh, hopefully, we can encourage the juniors to do it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Musha rasa a bit rotten dah now, actually. <laughs> well, you're still a good researcher, Musha. So, as I said, uh, you know, there's differences in people. Uh, there may be those who do not do PhD but still flourish in research because you do have that researcher mindset. Uh, but uh, by and large, people, many people get into the researcher mindset only by doing PhD. By doing the PhD. Correct. Okay. Uh, any other question from the audience? What well, we still have Provza online. Uh, the number of attendees is about 25, uh, Provza. Okay. Um, probably, kalau dah tak ada soalan, probably last, last advice, Prof. Anything that you want to, any uh, at the end, you want us to remember. Okay. Uh, never give up. Um, take uh, whatever comes your way as a challenge. Like for example, you know, the change from um, uh, Scopus, WOS, semua boleh, 
to suddenly a WAS saja yang you are encouraged to publish in that kind of thing and many other challenges along the way okay mm -hmm. to you as a researcher um, as um, challenges in your stride okay and never give up uh, there's always light at the end of the tunnel okay get yourself into teams uh, don't just work alone, okay? Now I think we've got lots of teams in uh, uh, the medical faculty. If you don't know where to go to, uh, look around, see where uh, you may start with your own department first or you may even look across to other departments. There may be people with like-minded people like yourself with, this, with similar interests that you can work with, okay? So uh, find somebody who can jive with you Okay, and uh, all the best in your research uh, endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Zah. Thank you for your excellent talk, your advice, and also your time, Prof. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. Okay. So, um, we will move next to Prof. Uh, Dr. Lisa Sharmini, Ahmad Tajuddin from USM. Is Prof. Lisa there? My com prof. Prof. Lisa's talk is going to be on the my research journey for impactful research and how do I attain it. So let's wait until. Uh, okay. Hi, prof. Prof. Uh, prof. Lisa. Can Good you hear see me? you. Chante background. Oh. <laughs> Uh, last minute background because I'm not. I mean, I'm not the 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 one that been using Zoom all the time. Okay. So suddenly I just a good assistant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Prof. Uh, we have right. just finished the talk by Prof. Zah just now mm -hmm. about the importance of impactful research in our um, journey as an academician. So kita start terus eh, Prof. Zah, eh? All right. Okay. okay sure, sure. Um, our audience at the moment is mainly from our own department and also we also invited someone, uh, some other lecturers and also researchers from other university and also trainees. Yeah? So um, allow me just to introduce briefly Prof. Zah. Allow me just to share screen. Actually, tak perlu introduction sebenarnya, tapi kena buat juga. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have this nice, well, this Prof. Zah has like, more than 10 pages of length of resume so i was trying to simplify it <laughs> so prof lisa is currently the senior consultant and also the professor in usm kota baru as everyone knows uh prof has also published more than 100 articles more than 10 chapters in a book that also include the teaching materials um of course prof lisa is well known for being our prominent speaker uh, among our ophthalmology fraternity locally and internationally and recently, I would like to highlight that Prof has been awarded as one of Toko Huanta Kelantan. I think that's very important because not many ophthalmologists. I think the first ophthalmology is Toko Huanta Kelantan for 2020. And uh, not to forget, Prof Riza is also uh, the teacher for many of us. And Prof Riza, I think one of my examiner when I sit for my exam during my uh, postgraduate uh, exam. Now, Prof. Lisa is also one of the, uh, is our representative and she is one of the uh, committee for the, uh, in, in the board for the Asia Pacific uh, APAO, Association of Ophthalmology. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Lisa for your topic on my research journey for impactful research and how do I attain it. Now, I stop the sharing, Prof. Lisa, and yeah. I'll pass it back to you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon. Uh, Musha, I didn't know that I'm your examiner. Must you be. Must, <laughs> must be. <laughs> because <have> to be. <laughs> so you can uh, sort of like uh, uh, gauge my age lah if no. I must be really old. <laughs> no, no. Very experienced prof. That's what okay. I'm trying to highlight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me share my experience as compared to Prof. Zah just now. I don't think my experience as good as her. But never, never mind, it will be sort of like an ophthalmologist journey. Let me share my, my, my slide. Okay, can you see my slide now? Uh, prof. Zah, your voice is a bit soft now. I'm not sure, okay. is it only me or is it Adin? Is it okay now? Is it better? Um, one more time, Prof. Uh, is it okay? Uh, slightly better. Better, yeah? What about the other audience? Are you guys okay with the sound? Uh, all the attendees, I hope it's going to be fine. 
So no comment. I think should be okay, Prof. Should we just proceed? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, okay. It's okay, Prof. Liza, boleh. Can. Yeah, boleh, eh? mm -hmm. Okay, can you see my slide right now? Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, uh, initially I was wondering why you are inviting me. I don't think my, my research is as impactful as Prozza, but nevertheless, let us share uh, my experience throughout. So, um, as you know, once you are in the academy or once you graduated as specialist, you ask yourself, who are you now? Are you just a clinical specialist, an ophthalmologist, seeing patient day and night? That's it. Are you uh, also a teacher, or to the academician is a lecturer? Uh, are you a scientist, a researcher, or are you just an administrator, or are you all the above? We know the answer is regardless you are in the academic world or you are in the hospital, KKM hospital, or in a private hospital, you still have to do A, B, C, and D. Right? And why are we here, either as a specialist or as an academician? All, are, all of us are knowledge creator. So you have to create knowledge. If not, you are not giving anything else to the world because if you are seeing only patient without creating any knowledge, you are doing your day-to-day -day work without any extra input from you because while doing research, you are putting yourself into immortal. People will remember you forever. So what you need to do is while you see patient day-to-day -day patient, you may identify or you may encounter some problem or some issue. So just don't let it be. Try to solve that issue. How to solve that issue is by doing research. Once you have done your research, don't keep it to yourself. Publish it. Make the public aware about it. If not the public, the scientific community aware about it. Okay? But the problem is, once you want to do research, make sure your research is impactful. Meaning that I always tell my students, good research means research for good. Meaning that you have to do research not suka-suka hati, it's for yourself. No, you must make sure your research contribute to something. The very least is to your patient, to the society, or to create new knowledge. It's, it's, it's what Prof. Zah is doing. She even go into economy, K economy, knowledge-driven economy, and many others. So you make sure that when you do the research, it's like telling a story. When you tell a story, it must be a moral of the story. So this is how good research becomes research for good. Okay. Right. I always tell them that doing research is like a marriage. First, you have to date. To find ideas. Ideas is very important in doing research. So you have to date a lot of people, see a lot of people as handsome or beautiful as these two people. And once you think this is good, you need to write a proposal. Find a ring to be engaged. Okay, writing a proposal is another challenge to us. Then you cannot do your research alone. You have to have you cannot conduct your marriage alone or your wedding alone. You need the help from your family and friends. So that is where collaboration comes into. When all is this done, then there you are, you get your grants to, to conduct your research. So that is your marriage. That does not stop there because your research are supposed, or your marriage has supposed to produce anak-anak kecil lah. So anak-anak kecil ni is your publication or your product of your research okay right so i would say my journey is quite not so not so bumpy not so quite nice and pleasant alhamdulillah because i think i got a lot of blessing from allah i have many kind collaborators many kind friends many uh, unexpected opportunity where I'm so uh, 
syukur lah because that opportunity just come just like that without I'm really looking for it. So I would say I have a lot of blessing during my journey for nearly, uh, nearly how many years since 2002. So it's almost uh, 18 years of uh, doing my research. Right. So what happened is after my graduation as a medical student become a medical uh, become a houseman. I did my houseman in Kuantan. I'm now in Kuantan in my in-laws house just arrived. And after my housemanship, I was sort of uh, forced to go to Kota Baru since my husband is in HUSM. Uh, HUSM. So I was posted in HRPZ uh, to hospital as a medical officer for pediatric. After two months, they forced me to go to orthopedic. I have this dislike of orthopedic. If there is any orthopedician here, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really do not like orthopedic, but I just do, it is just do not uh, really uh, think with my personality. So I said, rather than going for orthopedic posting, what are my options? They say, oh, I'm going, if you don't want to go there, you have to become MNHO, Medical and Health Officer in Pusat Kesihatan. So they sent me to this clinic Kesihatan Siliting, which is like half an hour drive from Kubang Kerian, I would say. Then when I was there, it was a total new experience because suddenly I'm the boss. I have a lot of staff under my wing and they are all older than me. Then suddenly when I was there, I told my boss there, Dr. Yasin, that uh, I already been accepted as trainee lecturer to USM. I'll be going at any time if they started the ophthalmology posting. So he was telling me, you want to go to university. You know what you are supposed to do? I said, I don't know. It's just that my husband is there. I want to go there. That's my real reason. They said, no, you have to learn how to conduct research. So he was the first one who taught me how to conduct research in the community. So he uh, sort of uh, discussed with me what, what I want to do, what his suggestion. So we came out with a project. But at that time, we don't have any money. So he said, never mind. I try to find money. So what he did is he go to get the money from polit politician. As you know, in Kelantan, you have pass and Parisa National, sort of. So each kampung, they will have pegawa from PAS and another representative from Barisan National. Okay, we have the money from there, but these people from Barisan National said, all this research must sort of promote them for political mileage. So what happened to us is we are supposed to detect new diabetic patient in the community by going from kampung to kampung. Uh, the funny thing is because of the political reason, I have to give the similar talk, let's say in, in the uh, school, it just the, in front of the school is the mosque. So today I talk in the school, then tomorrow I talk in the mosque, same talk, same community for the sake of politics. Because if I, I give the, the, the talk in the school, the past people wouldn't come. Then I have to repeat the same one, but luckily we managed to sort of like screen 1,000 plus patient uh, in the community. And that was my first research. And I have my first publication based on this research. At that point of time, I didn't know that my publication is so great. So, but I use it as my ticket for my master's program. So this was my first paper which was written initially was in Bahasa Malaysia. But it was quite an experience for me when I showed them for my interview to master program. Everybody said, wow, you already have done research. I was like, oh, is that so great? I do not, did not even know that the impact of this particular research to my application to the master program. Right, 
After that, yes, during my master's program, I decided to sort of do a lab base just to challenge myself because I have done a lot of clinical research. Why not do something different? So I go into histopathology world. I learn to stain, to do a card, microscopic card, reading slide, counting cells. It is challenging, but it is very interesting because, of course, it's challenging because I have to run between the clinic, OT, and coming to the uh, lab. But Alhamdulillah, I have another publication on my project for my master's program. And after I graduated from the master's program, I was thinking I want to do something different as my characteristic or my self personality, I always try to do something different from others. And I Google, Google up, there is no ocular geneticist in Malaysia. Hmm, I was thinking, why not I challenge myself to be someone that is interested in ocular genetics? So of course, another factor is my other half is doing genetics. I know he will actually drag me around in all the conferences of genetics. Might as well I know something about it. But uh, during my first two years as a specialist, I was wondering why I haven't seen a brush field spot in a Down syndrome baby. Is it because uh, our population is different? So there come another project whereby I have done an ocular uh, findings of Malaysian with Down syndrome. And true enough, there was no brush field spot seen in our patient. But we find a lot of things such as retinoblastoma associated with Down syndrome. To my surprise, I found one case of retinoblastoma in Down syndrome. Without me knowing, after this paper came out, there is a one group of researchers from France whereby what they did is they only uh, collect cases retinoblastoma in Down syndrome, so specific. So they contacted me, then we were chatting uh, through the email, because last time at the WhatsApp, yeah? So emails and uh, uh, we were communicating and he wants to know more about my cases. They were, uh, I asked him, how, uh, how do I go about collaborating with them? This go on for quite some time. And I never seen this, pe this person until I think six or seven years ago when I attended one of the meetings in Geneva. Without me knowing, I was sitting beside him. Then he said, uh, we were talking, we were talking, and then what's your name? Oh, I think we communicated before. See, I can't remember. Then he said, you were the one who sent us the case of this, this, this. Oh. Yeah, because we, uh, we, we specifically communicate personally with all these people who have this kind of cases so that I can remember you. It turned out this is Professor Lohman, the very known, uh, well-renowned professor who actually really work on genetic uh, Down syndrome and retinoblastoma. Uh, from that, I was thinking, okay, one is ocular genetics I have done on chromosomal this uh, abnormality. Why not go to molecular genetics? So at that particular time in 2002 to 2007, I think, pharmacogenetics is the in thing, sort of like one of the hypes for individualized, personalized medicine or something like that. So I was asking myself, at the same time I was asking myself, why is it our topical anti-glaucoma drugs beta blockers? We need a higher concentration in our patient, in an Asian patient compared to Caucasian patient. So I was discussing with another mentor, Professor Rosli Ismail. He was like, hmm, I also I have searched for you. I couldn't find why. Uh, there is there an issue of genetic basis in that. So he encouraged me to apply for a long-term grant, IRPA grant. This is a national grant. At that point of time, I was say, I'm just two years after my uh, specialty program. I don't think I'm good enough to apply for this, I told him. So he said, never mind, just apply. Put my name there, he said. Who knows, my name can help you. So I just applied, and to my surprise, this is my first grant, which is a national grant. I successfully get 
212,000 ringgit for this particular grant. Right, and I use this grant to actually for my project, PhD project uh, later on. And during my PhD project, I opt for an option of sandwich program. Sandwich program meaning that I collect data from Malaysia. So I have to spend certain amount of time, go back to UK and come back to Malaysia and go back to UK. So of course, there is going to be a lot of traveling. But I was thinking I'm just starting as an uh, academician. I cannot lose three years of not doing anything and concentrating on my PhD. So if I do a sandwich program, I can do a lot of other things to get myself started faster and to excel further as academician. So during that project, I also graduated one MSc student on human genetics. I get another grant, FRGS grant, as a project, le uh, project leader. So that is how I try not to lose three years only for my PhD study. Okay. And the funny thing is, how do I get my supervisor for my PhD project? It's all via email. I just look at his name on the net. I email to him. And we don't know much about him and he doesn't know much about me. So I always just want to tell everybody, sometimes you have to be bold. You have to just email. You do not know what, going, what is your luck will be. But lucky enough for me, he agreed to become my supervisor. So he said, oh, we, we have to meet up before I started my PhD. So there is a, he said there is another uh, glaucoma meeting in India in Chennai, let us meet up. So I, I, I get myself, uh, 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 myself to India. At the same time, I sort of presented my oral presentation there and I meet up with him. So of course, he have a lot of connection with other glaucoma specialists there. And out of the blue, without even knowing, I think because he was telling everybody he's taking me as his PhD student, I think some political link I won as the best oral presentation I get around 500 USD. Uh, I, I just, I, that's why I'm telling you, it's just a lot of luck during my journey as a researcher. So I get a certificate, I get a bit of money uh, to cover everything from my uh, expenditure to India. So then that is the advantage of having this sandwich program throughout three years that I get my PhD and I get uh, a mark for graduating a MSc student and another grant. Okay. So after that, after, I, uh, after my PhD, I continue with a lot of molecular genetics study in glaucoma, but most of it are single gene study and in a single population. Uh, these are the the one or two of uh, publication that I have on this single gene study, right? And all are Malays. So at the same time, I know that um, I should concentrate on Malay population because uh, based on the literature search and nobody actually are doing much on Malays, in, uh, especially on glaucoma and other diseases too. And the advantage of myself being in Kelantan, whereby 93% of them are Malays, this is another good advantage that I have to take this opportunity to sort of boost up my research. So at the same time, I collect uh, a lot of uh, observation on clinical, on the severity and uh, on PACG basically. Uh, in Malays and compare with other races. So the word goes around that I am the one who have been uh, published a lot on Malays, on glaucoma and genetics. Okay, so I, I was thinking why not I combine genetics, glaucoma and Malay and see what happened. At the same time, there is a, a international collaborators that are actually looking for a, somebody who has a, uh, sort of DNA of Malays uh, to include in their bigger multi-population study. So they were looking for me, then I said, yes, I have uh, sort of like 200 
plus of DNA of Malay and was screened properly with a proper uh, phenotype and genotype. So they wrote me in. And based on that, uh, I was have, uh, uh, especially uh, this is my mentor, Prof. Ontin, and because of that, he has sort of wrote me into a lot of uh, many other collaborative projects. I was introduced to even other big consortium like Global Eye Genetic Consortium. I was invited to many other inter international conferences just through this particular research. Okay, and based on this collaboration, uh, I have a lot of other opportunity, not just to be published in high impact, uh, journal, but I have the opportunity to get to know other collaborators and sort of like expand my research further. Okay, and apart from that, I was thinking not to stop just at genetic, why not look into other aspects of glaucoma? And I met other in internal collaborators, meaning that in USM, one are working on the vascular lab and the other on immunology lab. So I learned from them how to use this fluximeter and iotophoresis to actually uh, determine the endothelial function of the vessels and associated that with glaucoma patient. At the same time, we are collecting tears to study on the oxidative stress. So there is, I was thinking not to limit myself into just genetic as what my mentor, uh, Prof. Ontin, was advising me. They said, go on everything, full loaded of glaucoma. And based on this uh, vasculopathy kind of thing, uh, I got another grant uh, whereby we study on the uh, arterial stiffness and endothelial dysfunction. So you know, as you know, the vessels is actually regulated by all these autoregulation and receive stiffness vessel that meet the ocular perfusion pressure and ventricular dysfunction. So based on that particular thing, we found that there is no association with the anterior stiffness in terms of risk of glaucoma, but OPP or ocular perfusion pressure is associated with severity of glaucoma and endothelial dysfunction is not only associated with the risk, is also associated with the severity of glaucoma. That is one grant under research university individual grant that we have completed this. There is a few more papers coming up from this particular grant. Okay, since I'm known for a uh, uh, study on uh, glaucoma in Malay, so I was thinking why don't I make another series of study? And I do not want to compete in terms of epidemiology study, which is expensive. I have to uh, look, uh, I need a lot of uh, money and everything, but still fruitful and still impactful. So I sort of like launched a Malay glaucoma eye study where I call it MERGIS. This is basically a cross-sectional study to look into the modifiable risk factors for POAG and PACC patients. The modifiable risk factors include physical activity, secret smoking, diet, oxidative stress, and quality of life. We managed to collect 450 glaucoma patients and 500 controls. <laughs> I've completed this study actually, and we have actually produced quite a number of papers in quite high impact journal, for example, Journal of Glaucoma, and few other more coming up from this paper. So even now, we are doing a randomized control trial whereby we know uh, the high, uh, the, the food or fruits that high with antioxidants is sort of a uh, protective effect for severity of glaucoma. So we have then papaya whereby we send papaya to the house of the patient. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> and our outcome is quite good. After I've com completed this one, now, I have just secured a grant, Magis 2, 
uh, whereby this study, just now we are looking into modifiable risk factors, but this one we are looking into the rehabilitation side of glaucoma. So we look into mobility, navigation, breathing, exercise, and oxidative stress. And this study we divided into three phases. First, we do a cross-sectional study, study how the mobility, navigation, and the reading uh, process of a glaucoma patient based on severity. After that, we develop a rehabilitation program, validate that program, and after that, we'll do randomized control trial. Uh, this grant is just started because I just sort of secured that uh, in October this year. So we'll see what's going to happen, what is the finding after this, right? At the same time, remember, I was telling I want to become an ocular geneticist. So on another side, although I know my interest is in glaucoma, uh, since as uh, the one, the person who is interested in ocular genetics, I go into retinoblastoma. So, but again, this is on the genetic part and throughout the years, I think I started that in 2002. I stopped that once we have a pediatric ophthalmologist in, in USM. So we have uh, quite a number of people on the genetic of retinoblastoma. In fact, one of my students here, I think uh, Dr. Narayani Ramdi, uh, she already passed away for, uh, due to uh, breast cancer. But you can see how the paper actually uh, uh, keep having the citation for her even she's not a, a no longer around. Of course, uh, throughout my, uh, my journey as a researcher, postgraduate student is actually the main heart and soul of a research group. Okay, without them, I do not, uh, I don't think I can produce uh, quite a number of people. But of course, I teach them and they teach me we learn it together, we share idea. Of course, uh, as what Prof. Zah was saying, we should sort of uh, motivate this young mind. Uh, there are some of the research based on their ideas. For example, this one. This is not their dissertation. They just want to know how the visual impairment and uh, 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 diagnosis of newly diagnosed glaucoma. So I say, okay, fine. We design a study. So they design, uh, I designed the study, they conduct the study, and they have an extra publication while uh, after the end of their uh, master's program. This is another one whereby they want to see the efficacy of stimolo in gel forming solution. Is, which one is better, morning or evening dose? Uh, this is the funny one. I asked them to look into the effect of coffee in glaucoma, but they want to see the effect of budu. So I said, okay, fine, we'll do the effect of voodoo and the effect of coffee. So uh, uh, although the finding is uh, not so good, but at least they get their answers. And even some of them want to do on innovative such, such as rapid eye screening tests. And there's a lot more, whereby I just let them explore what they want to explore. All right. And of course, to make everything uh, uh, sort of running well, we have a glaucoma research group. This is one of uh, the members. I think this is in 2018. Uh, we have regular meetings, and during that meeting, uh, all the students, uh, research mode and mixed mode, will come together. They have their own re uh, progress report. And uh, at that point of time, usually we spend like one hour or two to troubleshoot, brainstorming with the, their problem. And of course, hunting them for their manuscript writing. <laughs> Usually most of them say they are more stressful than the progress interview uh, every four months. Okay, right. As I said, as what Professor was saying, teamwork is very, very important. This is myself and Prof. Azani, both of us are as a glaucoma specialist in USM. What I do is we do not compete. We conquer together, not conquer each other, but we conquer together. So that we divide our research, she will be more on surgical part, I will be more on medical part, but we help each other. So as I said, the most important thing is be inclusive, not exclusive. 
as what we know, teamwork is not that easy. The larger group you have, the more problem it could be. But you have what Prof. Zah was saying, to accept all the differences. Look at the good side of each person. So this is what we call uh, the politics of science. Right. For those who are starting, uh, uh, just, this is what I call academician web. In uh, USM, we have divided our activity into M1 to M5. M1 is research, M2 is teaching, M3 is academic recognition, M4 is consultation, and M5 is more of community work. But what I, uh, my suggestion is for those academicians, you should make everything M5, M1 to M5 to work together with you during the running of your clinic. Okay, let's say you are running your glaucoma clinic. Of course, you are training your uh, master student. So the training of master student will be M2. Okay, at the same time, you are uh, doing M4 and M5 all together. And at the same time, your research are supposed to be running together. So research niche. Usually in my clinic, it will be a lot of patients, a lot of students, and a lot of research assistants who are taking data, helping out. Some are taking blood. So you make sure the, the, the clinic that you run benefit you from M1 to M5. Okay? All right. So you can do this with uh, if you once you are quite okay with this, you will you will feel that that is a normal occurrence of your clinic. You don't feel that you were forced to run the clinic, and the clinic is so busy with a lot of things running all together. Right. Okay. For those a young uh, ophthalmologist, for example. Uh, these are my suggestion or my recommendation for area to explore. If you want to do a subspecialty on these three subspecialty, in terms of research, there are a lot to do on research. You don't have to compete much. Even a simple study will give you a lot of advantage. But if you decided to do retinal glaucoma of cataract, you need to come with a lot of new ideas because there's a lot being done in this kind of subspecialty. Cornea, external eye disease is not too bad. Trauma also there's an ample opportunity in terms of research. Okay. This is my proposal to young lecturers. You must concentrate on your clinical work, of course, have your subspecialty, at the same time start your research need, and you have your special interest. Special interest is something that you can merge with your research. That maybe you like photography, you can, you know, do it together, or you like computers so that you can do your AI and things like that. Okay, this is for those who are a bit uh, experience a bit senior, you have to go for the global impact rather than just national impact or into, into, into institutional in, uh, impact. Okay, as a conclusion, as a researcher, you have to be adventurous, always has this, uh, the feeling of to explore and learn, be bold, but humble, don't be bold, but bossy, be kind, once you are kind, others will be kinder. Be inclusive, not exclusive. And of course, teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. Believe me, it's really work. Okay, with that, I thank you. Wow, thank you, Fabrisa. <laughs> that was very interesting. Um, now, before I ask my question, but uh, any, anybody have any question? Any uh, participants? Uh, Probably I start with my question, Paulisa. Mm -hmm. uh, the Maji study, was that a multi-center kind of study or it's just located, I mean, all the patients are from Kelantan? Okay, for the Malay Glaucoma Eye Study, because I have students in uh, Alusta and also in uh, Terengganu, because uh -huh. I, uh, as you know, Kelantan, uh, Terengganu, Al uh, Kedah and Perlis are all the places that you have more than 90% Malays. Mm. So that is why I can recruit up to 450 of Malay 
uh, glaucoma patient and 500 control. So that you get all your students at different, different locations doing so-called one similar study? Yes, not kind similar. I, I divide that, that some are doing on the wrist, meaning between glaucoma and control. Some mm -hmm. are doing the severity, but they can help each other. To get the information. Yes, yes, yes. So you, you create a few proposals based on the uh, yes, say, popula uh, no, different population, but uh, under one big umbrella. Yes, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about your collaborators? Because I can see uh, when it comes to publishing the article, you have a lot of names there internationally, yeah. locally. Do yeah. you get them everybody on board from the beginning of the study or you slowly recruit them whenever it's needed? Uh, uh, in terms of big study, like for example, mm -hmm. Malay Glaucoma I study, they were already on board from the beginning. I see, I see. Uh, so they're helping out from the proposal stage and Yes, uh, proposal, I would say more of our side. Mm -hmm. But then after we are collecting samples and everything, they do uh, uh, voluntarily without forcing to uh, uh, have it out. If uh, I'm not sure anybody here from HKL, uh, if you see or for my Maggie study, usually there is one author for each, uh, for each institution. But for HKL, due to the political reason, I put both of the glaucoma specialists. <laughs> So that is a political game. <laughs> okay, okay. But everybody does contribute to the studies. So yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Just out of curiosity, because I know genetic is always quite expensive. What is the minimum figure of grant that you get for a genetic study? Uh, I mean, I how much is the minimum figure of genetic study? Uh, Minimum, if you want to do, is 50k. That is minimum but with a small more. single gene. You are not talking about microarray. So, right, right, uh, right. Most of my microarray is I collaborated. I have my own and I collaborated also with uh, uh, Singapore. Right, so right. if let's say I have 100K, I use up to that 100K, the rest will be covered by the Singapore uh, mm. clinic. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, Prof. Uh, one more is on the student side, you know, because we know that sometimes when you suggest a proposal to the students, sometimes they're not interested. <laughs> you can see that the, yes. the, the reaction throughout that four years when they carry out that project, you know. Yeah. And how, can you share your experience? How do you deal with that? How do you get the students to be as excited as you are doing that project? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, one thing I think I was lucky to get uh, 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 enthusiastic students whereby right. they come with their ideas and everything. But some of that I have to fast. I was telling them, you are start with me because you cannot change the supervisor. Once you are with me, it's going to be glaucoma, whatever the aspect of glaucoma. <laughs> Okay, um, okay. But then if they want to do a small project outside that they think of their interest, I do encourage them. So they still do go for glaucoma whenever they are under Provisa? Yeah. But let's and say instead of them uh, doing a case report, they can do small study. So I help right. them to uh, design the study. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they do like one of my students, I didn't put as an example, he's interested in VR. So he was doing a glaucoma study, but he, at the same time, he wants to collect data on IOFB mm -hmm. in his hospital. So I designed the study and we get it published on mm -hmm. uh, IOFB, what are the common cause and what mm -hmm. are the organism or all mm -hmm. those kind of things. But so, concurrently, she's also doing the, your study. Yes. Right, but sure. usually, this kind of student that are allowed to do a small project are the one with a good mm -hmm. academic standing. Right. So they can so, cope. Uh, yes, yes. Right. But if they, I know they are a bit uh, weak, I wouldn't suggest it. Okay, you just go for your case report. Right, right, right. right. So for those who are young academicians also, case report is fine. But case report is like side dishes. Original article is your main dish because this original article will give you more H in there as compared to your case report. So, yeah, you cannot wait for your case report to gain like 100 citation over two years or three years. But original article can do that for you. Right, right. Um, now, going back to your PhD, because you had a sandwich kind of PhD, right? Yeah. So here and there, here and there. Yes. And I think it's very, very beneficial as a clinician. Uh, not many of us, I suppose, will get the opportunity to do so. 
what do you think of having the idea of having a PhD running concurrently with your master's? Because I've seen uh, mm-hmm. some students did that in Australia in particular. You know, some good students actually managed mm-hmm. to come up with a PhD concurrent with a master's. I think that would be an interesting idea then that people can easily work on rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. having a split kind of program. Yeah. Uh, is it doable or is it something yes, like Yes, yes. Oh, while I was doing my PhD in uh, Institute of Ophthalmology, there is one student a good student, a daughter of one of the world-renowned uh, oculoplastic surgeon. She was doing sort of like um, undergraduate uh, MBBS plus PhD. MBBS, that's undergraduate. Yes. <laughs> and I, I feel I'm so old because she is like 21. <laughs> I was with okay. three kids already. Yeah. So she sort of like uh, in the third year, she took the time off to concentrate on her PhD. After she completed that, she will com- uh, continue with fourth and fifth year. So by the time she graduated, she got a double degree already and she prepared herself for uh, specialty training. Mm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in USM, actually, we have sort of like, uh, uh, I have, um, per, uh, I have uh, proposed this and was accepted by our postgraduate uh, committee, uh, subspecialty together with the PhD. It subspecialty is a, together with yeah, the PhD. It's okay. going to be a four years kind of course. So you can either start with your subspecialty first, continue with PhD and uh, sandwich it together with your PhD or you can start your PhD first, sandwich it together with your subspecialty. So you do not have to, you know, sort of like uh, rugi lah kan? So you correct, get correct. For the good students, yeah. Yes, yes. What about incorporating in our postgraduate students? I, I think for postgraduate students, we have to think about it. Uh, <laughs> because it's going to be four years I guess yeah. uh, now we have a research component in ours but it's not so in-depth uh, maybe we have to add on another two years to make it sort of in-depth and I'm just a bit worried in terms of uh, KKM people are they alright with that right, but I'm right. sure you know I think, suppose probably can open the idea for the university yeah, yeah, right, yeah, uh, yeah, because, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah as you said yeah. it's some kind of doable but probably it's not something norm Yes, 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 yes. But okay. Uh, no, there's no more question yet, Prof. Because I think you've covered a lot of things. <laughs> I was like listening, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything, Prof, before we probably close the session while waiting for any okay. so far, there's no question. Uh, uh-huh. Anything, Prof, that you would like to say your last word to, to, to uh, us? I think um, maybe my journey is not too bad because I was so lucky. I have a lot of good mentor. Uh, one of my uh, forever mentor is my own uncle who used to be a deputy vice chancellor in ESM. Yeah. Uh, before I start off, even when, before I go for the interview to become academician, he was keep telling me, do you know what are you going for? I said, I don't. Do you know even if you are a clinician, you still have to do research. You cannot do without it. To you, so prime yourself. Yes, and he was telling me at least read two journal a day. I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> and then, true enough, once I you know, I graduated, especially and everything. Yes, you are forced yeah, even to read that. more than two journal a day, right? right so right. Uh, then, because uh, perhaps because he was sort of like being primed earlier, so that my journey was more focused. And I know what I, I'm supposed to achieve at what point of time. So for the young one also, you can do it and you can do better than me. Uh, whereby you have to know your niche area. What you want to do in your research. For example, uh, <laughs> you, uh, if you know me, if like Prof. Wan, if, uh, if he tells you about me, he will say that the first two years of my, uh, after my postgraduate training, I want to do I want to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be oculoplastic surgeon, pediatric surgeon, until Prof. Wan asked me to sit down. He's like, you cannot do everything. Now choose. <laughs> so I said, oh yeah, I have to choose. So but during the period that I want to do everything, I experienced a lot. 
I try a lot. But at that point of time, no many people, not so many people in my department, only three or four of us. So of course, I was forced to do everything. So from there, I know that my niche area is perhaps something to do with research plus clinical. At that point of time, I think glaucoma is the best. That's why I choose glaucoma. But for you guys as a young one, uh, don't go, go beyond me. Like for example, AI. Whatever it is, your subspecialty, now people are going to deep learning, AI, and beyond that. So start now, focus on that. Because it's not just for your career, but you can uh, benefit mankind in a lot of ways. In, I, uh, you know, COVID is a blessing in a way. If, if there is no COVID, people wouldn't even, you know, blink an eye for AI or even online uh, meeting like this. But now you, can, you have to think something towards that line and make yourself prominent. We cannot forever stand on the shoulder of Singapore. We have to stand on our own. We have more people than they are but we still cannot excel better than them. But if we do it together, don't be territorial, be inclusive, not exclusive. I think we can move further. But to get those people to work together, teamwork, that is the major challenge. For example, until now in Malaysia also, uh, Kamusha, Retina, someone is doing this, someone is doing that, <laughs> and you end up... That's like, my work, that's your work. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Same goes with glaucoma also, you know. Uh, okay, this is mine. Uh, you cannot catch out me. Mine, all the, yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> if we do it together, we get a bigger sample size. We can make it more meaningful of our research rather than, okay, you collect 20, I collect 30, and both of us are trying to publish this. Why not merge this and you get 50? Right. Something like that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, very, very good advice, Dr. Lisa. Yeah. All right. Very that interesting. Is nice. yeah. Thank you so much. So for the young ones, keep exploring until you get your niche. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, we have come to the end, Provisa. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Thank you for okay, thank for you for time. inviting me. Yes, the sharing session. Yeah. Um, it's actually been recorded now. Hopefully, okay. we can share it somewhere. Yeah, if you don't mind, Provisa. Yeah, sure, sure. Very beneficial for, for especially the young lecturers. Um, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Provisa, and to the attendees. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us, and hope to be able to invite you again, Provisa, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.